Now this one's been a long time coming and something that I've been meaning to get off my chest for a long time. Guys, sport touring motorcycles suck. No one is more critical of a drinker than a former drunk, and as a reformed sport touring dad, I find myself completely looking down my nose at these nerds on their dorky steeds, but I understand where they're coming from. They wanted a sport bike because the plastics are cool and flashy, but they didn't want to be folded up like an origami swan on their bike when they go out for a ride on the weekends. The only problem is with the motorcycle market set up the way that it is right now, there really isn't a point to having a sport sport touring motorcycle anymore, or at least sport touring bikes as we know them, portly sport bikes with relaxed ergos and heated grips. This video is going to be a bit different since I couldn't really come up with 7 reasons why, so I decided to turn this into more of a video essay. I guess you could call it a so you don't want a sport touring motorcycle, or I guess more appropriately, why you don't want a sport touring motorcycle. Grammatical hangups aside though, while I do acknowledge the value of having sporty yet comfortable motorcycles, I find them a little bit obsolete considering what we've got instead. First, let's take a moment to define sport touring motorcycles, because I think it's helpful to generate a mental image before we go too far into this one. A sport touring bike is a fully fared motorcycle packing an engine derived from a proper sport bike, has taller clip-ons or handlebars, a lower seat, accommodation for passengers, luggage, and usually has a lot of technology crammed into it. We're talking cruise control, traction control, wheelie control, and all the goodies. If they're under a thousand cc's, they tend to run between 90 and 110 horsepower, and if they're over a liter, they're usually pushing about 130 to 150 horsepower. Now, let's have a quick little history lesson and explain where sport touring motorcycles came from. Now, the first bike we could consider a sport tourer was the 1977 BMW R100 RS. Obviously, there were a lot of quote-unquote sporty touring motorcycles before that, but this is the first one that fits our definition of a fully fared sport bike. It was an air-cooled boxer putting down 70 horsepower and 56 foot-pounds of torque, which for the time was really quick. Seeing as how it was built for distance, it needed to be low maintenance or at least very easy to maintain, and anyone who's ever owned a BMW boxer can tell you how easy those are to work on. Better still, it featured a shaft drive to eliminate drivetrain maintenance or at least make the interval so far apart that the average rider wouldn't even need to worry about it. It's so influential that a lot of big BMW land barge sport tourers can trace their lineage directly back to this motorcycle. Not to be outdone, Honda took their flagship superbike, the CB1100X, which had recently been beaten by the GS1100E, and put a massive front fairing on it in bags from the factory. Unfortunately for the Honda, an inline 6 doesn't exactly make for worry-free maintenance with an incredibly complex engine and 6 carbs to mess with. So while it was really cool and it's a collector's halo bike nowadays, they officially killed it off in 1982. They came back a year later with the the V45 Interceptor, which redefined what a sport touring bike could be. They took race bike technology, added more wind protection, and released a comfortable motorcycle that could hang with just about any other sport bike out there. Now, through the 90s and early 2000s, we started to see a split in sport touring bikes form. Germany decided to make gigantic motorcycles like the R1200 RT and K1600s, with Japan producing Concourse, Hayabusa's, and FJRs, but they were really only meant for well-off older riders because because of how expensive and heavy they were. Yeah, they could handle okay, but they were more touring than for sport riding. Japanese manufacturers also had these championship winning sport bikes lying around, and they figured if they were good enough for the track, they could make them good enough for the street too, so you started to see bikes like the FZ6 and FZ1 come around. Cheaper and more accessible versions of sport bikes, down-tuned for street performance but with comfortable ergos and still plenty of plastic so you could feel like a proper street Rossi. The only problem is that they were super heavy compared to sport bike counterparts, and people found that naked bikes were better on the daily to satisfy that sport bike itch. Nowadays, the smaller displacement sport touring bike category is basically dead. You had bikes like the VFR 800, which were no longer offered in America as of 2015, and now the only sub 1000cc bike that's offered with hard bags and fairings is the Ducati Super Sport. There is the RS660 though, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. It's still a very solid option. Hey you! Are you watching this video the day it went live? Live. Are you part of the notification gang? Well, I've got something pretty exciting for you. This is the absolute last day you can get entered to win this Aprilia RS660. We're talking about sport touring bikes in today's video, and we all know they emit a certain kind of nerd energy. So if you want a badass motorcycle that is basically a secret sport touring bike, 
get this thing and get it for free over on ynmoto.co or yamanubemerch.com. Use the code RS660 for 2X entries and 10% off. Again, this is the last day you can get entered to win this bike. Let's get back to the video. Next up, I wanted to take a quick look at some of the motorcycles that are being sold today as sport touring bikes. And while I'm going through them, see if you can spot the difference between these and a Goldwing. Let's start out with the BMW R1250 RT. It's the modern version of the RS we talked about a little bit earlier, and it's packing a 1254cc boxer putting down 136 horsepower and 105 foot-pounds of torque. That's pretty good for an old airplane engine. The only problem is that you can't really enjoy it because the bike weighs 615 pounds wet before rider, passenger, and luggage. You do get rider modes, adjustable suspension, heated grips, and all sorts of modern goodies, but you're going to pay through the nose for it. You can get the base bike for $19,695, but I will remind you it is illegal to buy a base model BMW, so get ready to spend $24,195 on a bike that you can probably be outrun on by a Ninja 650. But what about modern Japanese offerings? Surely there's going to be one that's a little less nerdy, right? Well, let's take a gander at the FJR 1300 ES, Yamaha's answer to the comfy long distance sport touring question, and one that they've boldly claimed is a super sport tourer. It's packing a 1298cc inline four, putting down 142 horsepower and 102 foot-pounds of torque, which is better than what the Beamer has, but it's heavier at 642 pounds. It's got an electronically adjustable suspension, lean-sensitive headlights, and all the rider modes and nannies you might expect. For all intents and purposes, it's a carbon copy of the R1250 RT, but with an inline four instead of a boxer. Mercifully, the bike is cheaper than the BMW at $17,000, $1,999, but it's still a lot of money for a bike that's really just built to munch highway miles. The Concourse 14 isn't much better, and the Busa isn't sure what it wants to be anymore, and for your money, you can get a lot more bike if you look elsewhere. I'm going to suggest that if you're interested in the sport touring lifestyle, and you want to crush big miles and still have a bike that can carve up a corner really well, you don't want a sport tourer. You want an adventure bike. If manufacturers were actually honest with themselves, they'd admit that big ADVs aren't meant for off-road riding. They're meant for riding down miles of twisty back roads from one state to another. You've got a ton of wind protection from windscreens as big as boogie boards, super comfortable upright ergonomics, and the exact same level of tech for basically the same price. Let's take a look at the KTM Super Adventure S. It'll run you $18,599, though closer to twenty dollars with all the bags and stuff, so it's right in line with all these premium dad bikes. The best part is it's on cast 120 70 17s and 170 60 17s, which are fairly standard tire sizes, so you don't need to worry about finding rubber for this bike. That's even better considering you'll need to replace the rear tire fairly often thanks to a whopping 160 horsepower and 101 foot pounds of torque from a 1301 cc V twin, and it weighs less than 500 pounds wet and ready to ride. Of course, you have a big TFT display, USB charger, rider aids, lean sensitive cornering ABS, and a ton more, but beyond the tech, you've got fully adjustable WP suspension, and if you want to, you could take the thing off-road thanks to an off-road mode. One of my riding buddies has a previous gen 1190 Super Adventure, and he loves it for all-day riding, and we regularly do over 150 miles on our weekend rides. There's a plethora of adventure bikes out there, from the Tenere 700, which is a more off-road capable bike, to the Ducati Multistrada, which is probably the world's most advanced motorcycle full stop. If you want a full breakdown on which the best ones are, we made a video on it, so you can go check that one out. Seriously though, don't turn your nose up at these motorcycles. But who am I kidding? You don't care about adventure bikes, you think they're goofy looking, you want something that's flashy with all the fairings and the corner carving performance of a sport bike and that laid back style. Well, I've got two for you. One that's for normal people and one that's for people who love cocaine. Let's start out with the normal one, the RS660. Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of spoiled it a little earlier, but it is a great option for someone who wants a motorcycle that's more sport than touring. I made a whole living with on this motorcycle, but to give you the too long didn't watch, it's packing a 660cc parallel twin, making 100 horsepower and 50 foot-pounds of torque. But most importantly, it's a sport bike that you can ride comfortably for a long time. Yes, I did have some issues after about an hour and a half in the saddle, but if you ride it more often, you will get used to it. It's basically a better version of Honda's 2014 VFR 800. It's got adjustable suspension, fully adjustable rider modes and settings, cruise control, and hidden under the passenger 
passenger seat is a top case rack, so you can bolt up a box to it and hit the road, or slap a milk crate on there if you're feeling cheap. Admittedly, this one really isn't meant for two-up touring, or even one-up touring, frankly, but follow me on this one. People often turn to sport touring motorcycles like the VFR and FZ6 because they're fun and sporty without the crazy committed ergonomics with more power than your typical 650. If you're a person looking for a sport bike that's dailyable, then this is for you. It also helps that it's only 11,499 bucks. Now for that coked out entry, because I know you want to hear about it, the Kawasaki H2 SX Plus SE, which sounds more like a math problem than a sport bike, but man alive, this is a one of a kind ride. It's packing the H2 motor with its trademark supercharger, putting down a mind shattering 228 horsepower and 105 foot pounds of torque. This bike is not for the faint of heart because winding this thing out is truly a butt puckering experience. The crazy thing is that they made a motorcycle that's relatively light for what it is, at only 528 pounds, and it's comfortable due to its relaxed ergonomics. Now, while I'm not exactly sure about throwing a pillion on the back of this beast, Cowie does show people doing two-up riding on their website, so it is possible, but if you find yourself on the back seat, you best hold on for dear life. It's not a cheap motorcycle at $25,500, but there's literally nothing else like it in the world, and it's got everything that you would expect for the money. Now, before we move on, I'd also recommend taking a look at the Humble Naked Bike. If you slap a pair of saddlebags and a windscreen on one, you're 90% of the way there, and there are so many different kinds of naked bikes out there. You've got the massive 180 plus horsepower monsters out there, intermediate bikes that run about 120 horsepower and are still super comfortable all the way down to 650s and below. Anyone can get into quote unquote sport touring for not a lot of money with any naked motorcycle. Now, I've talked a lot about a bunch of different motorcycles today, so let's start drawing some conclusions. Modern sport touring motorcycles, as we know them, suck. They're heavy, they're slow, and compared to other styles of motorcycle, they're pretty trash at being sporty. I think that where the 600 pound plus fully fared bikes are concerned, manufacturers should just drop all pretense of sport from these bikes and just make them touring motorcycles. That way, manufacturers could make them the best touring bikes they could possibly be and let other motorcycles motorcycles that are better suited to the sort of dual purpose riding take the center stage. Much like middleweight to describe bikes that are making between 90 and 130 horsepower, sport touring has become a catch-all for any motorcycle that is comfortable and sporty. It's lost all of its meaning and I think it should just be retired. To make a long story short, don't be a nerd! Don't buy a sport touring motorcycle. Fact, in the 1920s and 30s, many movie theaters had signs instructing ladies to please remove your hats to keep elaborate headwear from blocking anyone's view. Goodbye. Oh, hey, you're still here. I can't believe you made it to the end of the video. Not many people do. Just for you, I have a little treat. Hit this link over here, check out the next video on the Yamanoob catalog. What's gonna happen in it? I don't really know. Maybe there's a boost in it. Maybe there's some cool wheelies. Maybe there's some fun memes. Probably. Who can say?